the chair and delegates. Hope you enjoyed this conference. Before we start, I'd just like to check how many of you in the room have actually heard or used about uh, shockwave? <coughs> no one? Heard about it? Yes? Okay, not a worry. So, this is our presentation and we work with several universities around the world. The Ludwig Boltzmann in Austria. We also work with the International University of Milan. and the Auckland University. So, I only have um, academic research support, but I'm not the director or shareholder of any of the companies. So, these are three of the companies. There are so many companies which make shockwave devices like Siemens and Storz. These are the three who support our research work in terms of provision of the devices. So our primary aim today is to actually discuss the use of shockwaves, all right, and to encourage research collaboration, okay, and partnerships, um, hopefully in the Middle East. We are having discussions outside of this conference with Abu Dhabi and many other of the DHAs here. But we would like to invite any one of you here who is interested to know more about uh, these collaborations to contact us, okay? So. I cannot see very well from here. So anyway, diabetic foot ulcers, as we know, is a complex form of pathology to manage. Uh, it is attributed to the progression of um, diabetes despite adequate glycemic control. And the primary causes are seen to be neuropathy, circulatory issues, and of course, this in turn diminishes the synthesis of growth factors and tissue. There's also a significant amount of um, pathological immune dysregulation, especially in the macrophage uh, stage of function, causing the wounds to continuously inflame and fester and develop infections, and of course the ultimate squalor of potential gangrene amputations. So the most commonly seen uh, complication, about 15 to 25% of diabetes sufferers would develop some form of complex ulcer. Ischemic would have these attributes. Neuropathic would have the following attributes, but without pain. And neuroischemic would have some form of sensory deficits. You most of the time will feel pressure but you have lost protective sense and that is why it is quite dangerous because the diabetic sufferers, when they walk, they would feel the foot pressure against the floor because their pressure receptors are working, but protective, protective sense, thermal regulation, sharp, blunt sensations have been lost, but they do not know that they've lost this sensitivity because continuous detection of pressure, so they fail to recognize that they are neuropathically predisposed. Now, the current management guidelines include, as most of you, everyone here would know, is uh, primary and secondary control of the disease issue, which is mainly glycemic. Uh, uh, habits like smoking, alcoholism is also something which are high risk contributors. The primary focus is aimed at uh, the improvement of both micro and macro circulation where possible. Um, I think neutrocyticals would be an important factor because pharmaceuticals can, there is no known pharmaceutical uh, remedy at the moment that is known to do this. Um, wound management and infection control is very important. That is the various types of debridement, uh, negative pressure weight therapy, uh, biofilm detection and elimination, offloading of pressure regions, um, they have been using a lot of customized orthotics. I don't think the expensive orthotics are necessary. The most important one would be shock absorption and cushioning. They are the most economical and are, from our experience, seem to be as effective as those expensive foot orthotics. 
All these measures are hoped to aim and prevent against amputations. You hearing me okay? Yes. All right. So, a brief description and reintroduction is in all forms of diabetes, both one and two. We hope to reduce neuropathic ischemia, uh, impaired tissue synthesis, control uh, infection, and of course, habituals aimed at the management of preventing ulcerations and ultimately amputations. But how effective are these strategies? How many of you here are actually in the wound uh, departments of your hospital managing with ulcers? Okay. Economic viability and sustainability because it is very expensive to maintain uh, continuously uh, prevention of amputation in chronic ulcers. Are there other methods? And that's what we are going to visit today. So extracorporeal shockwave treatment is an adjunct to the management of diabetic foot ulcers. So there are various types <coughs> of shockwave devices, electrohydraulic, magnetic, crystal base, and radial, which we do not use in the case of ulcers. Okay, that's for physiotherapy. Um, a brief highlight, shockwaves or medical shockwaves were first used to eradicate kidney stones. All right, so kidney stone lithotripsy is where it came from. In the 1990s, we first used it in orthopedics for bone, uh, and it's evolved into sports medicine. And for the past 10 years, we've been using it for wound healing. So this is one of our work, which was published in 2012. And we're going to give you the brief. We used both, we treated both non-diabetic and diabetic ulcers, all right? And what we saw is re-epithelialization and healing in both groups were not different between diabetic ulcer and non-diabetic ulcer, which means we actually gave them an equal platform, even though one had various other pathologies. The number of three, this is 45, 48 days worth of healing time. From the first treatment, a total of three to five sessions are given once every week. And uh, it makes it a very viable and economic tissue option. These are some of the changes in tissue. This was seven days after the first treatment of ESWT, so it shows re epithelialization, revascularization, and growth proliferation in the region of the womb. This was another case where we uh, treated with four shockwave treatments. And two months later, it was not festering, it was closed, okay? Another case where 52, latest, 52 days and four sessions, we were able to close the wound. So in 75% uh, of the cases that we treated, we have got resolution. This was a case which uh, another colleague of mine in Taiwan, Professor Wang, he did um, the comparison of shockwaves against hyperbaric chambers. And so the number of population across the group, 40. And what we see is a higher amount of tissue res uh, resolution within the shockwave group versus the hyperbaric group. And of course, we are talking about a number of four or five sessions, again, of shockwaves. Uh, what would be the cost comparison? How many have used hyperbaric um, chambers? The cost comparison is huge. You're talking about tens of thousands versus less than $5,000 worth of treatments. So this is the shockwave group. We see the perfusion status in shockwave therapy versus hyperbaric. We see an increased amount of perfusion, which means we have been able to resolve one of the primary contributors, which is ischemic correction. This is our histo histological feature, which shows baseline growth proliferation in the shockwave group versus HBOT. And this was published in uh, this Journal of Diabetes Research and Clinical Practice. 
So the physics of shock waves is different from an ultrasound. An ultrasound is a sinusoidal wave, but a shock wave is a very violent <coughs> type of wave. Okay, it's got a high peak rise time and a very, very quick implosion time. And this is focused and targeted onto an area of pathology. Be it in this case, we are talking about ulcers, but we do it, we do use a lot of it in sports medicine as well. So Electrohydraulic, my personal choice of uh, devices are electrohydraulic because we can use them both in a focus and diffuse wave pattern, which means if you've got a small region of complaint or pathology, we can focus it to that size and if we have a larger diffused area, we can also remodel the wave to have a more diffuse pattern covering a larger area with the same amount of treatment. So, the slide is not working. So that, okay. Okay, it's not working on this laptop. So the difference is one is using, uh, it's like a depth charge. When you drop uh, explosive in water, you have a sound wave, all right? The difference is the sound wave is actually reflected by an elliptical reflector to have a focusing or targeting effect. Uh, the other one which I we, we put, the, put the cross on is radial pulse. It's, they call it a shock wave, but it is, it is not a shock wave. It doesn't have the same characteristic of a shock wave. It is more a mechanical pulse. This is used for physiotherapy and should not be used in any diabetic or wound management, okay? Regardless of what the company is telling. So a different physical characteristic will have a diff different physical outcome. So that's why you cannot call a light bulb a laser. So you cannot call a radial pulse a shock wave. I'm, I'm, I don't know what's wrong with this laptop. I'm sorry, it's not reading my slides correctly. It's taking its time. So these are the mechanism of action of shock wave. So the stimulus actually increases <coughs> cellular permeability. Uh, there is a, a host of biocellular changes which occur. We have recently done an uh, animal study uh, to, to look at how shockwave actually have got stem cell modulations. It will be, um, it will be, uh, it is in press, it will be out uh, in, in, in publication pretty soon. We have seen the change in macrophage. So as you know, we've got pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory macrophages. What happens with shock waves is we actually reduce the macrophage M1, which is pro-inflammatory, and we increase M2 expression of macrophages, which are anti-inflammatory. Their expression actually introduces a lot of transforming growth factors like TGF beta and uh, veg endothelial collagen synthesis. So what happens is the primary problems associated with diabetic um, issues, we have got tissue synthesis disruptions because of the various uh, uh, systemic is uh, issues associated with diabetes. When we introduce sound waves, we actually tend to correct those peripheral issues associated with diabetes, both in type 1 and type 2, which is why we can have a higher uh, success rate of uh, tissue regeneration and wound closure. So that is the same slide. It basically talks about the pathway towards homeostatic return. Shock waves have been used in all these various disciplines. It was first used to eradicate Chris, uh, kidney stones. Um, a, a, a systemic review of um, the patients that undergone kidney stone lithotripsy. We did a 10 year review and we found that actually there was no harm from the use of high intensity shock waves to obliterate a kidney stone. And then shock waves was adapted to use in sports medicine. It is used in cardiology because the primary uh, mode of action that we know about is the stimulation of angiogenesis. So it is used very successfully in cardiology. I don't deal with that. And of course, it's gone back to urology in the sense that we use 
low intensity sound waves for erectile dysfunction because the primary um, action is angiogenetic and circulatory correction or hypoxic correction. So in diabetes, you find that there's also another discipline which we are not <coughs> discussing today is diabetic related erectile dysfunction. So we find that you will be able to use shockwaves in the same uh, area. But here, of course, we are talking about the diabetic foot ulcer, which we've started using. We've been using this since 2005. The primary reason of the use for shockwaves is systemically neutral. There's no pharmacological input, and therefore we do not find that we are introducing systemic risk. Um, the third factor, which is most important to us, is we actually correct the hypoxic and ischemic issues associated with diabetes. So shockwaves have the ability to correct these issues. It is also neuromodulation because, as we know, the adjutant is both the blood supply and the neurocirculatory system. So when we have positive correction in the circulatory system, we also have neuronal modulation, which is part of neuroischemic issues associated with diabetic foot ulcers. The inflammatory modulation, again, is the macrophage uh, interplay whereby we have a heightened increase of type 2 or M2 macrophage against M1 macrophage. So we then have the inflammatory modulation, which is also infection control, which is then translated into tissue synthesis and promotion. We have a high rate of resolution compared to what we've seen that is currently used, and we have a low amount of treatments required for tissue resolution which makes it economically viable and we invite more research. Can we prevent diabetic ulcers? That is to be debated because we tried one study so far because we know that the sensory deficit predisposes the sufferer to develop wounds which will not heal. What we noted was when we closed the wounds, we also started to find that the patients rediscovered their sensory perception. So we did a case study and we utilized shockwaves in an insensate, this is an impress, insensate type 1 diabetic, no ulceration whatsoever, but the foot was completely insensate. So, sorry for the very crowded slide, but I will. I will tell you that our clinical or standard clinical, like the monofilament tuning fork, completely more, no perception in both left and right. So we took him to the university center and we used biothesiometer. In a normal foot, you know, we are talking about 15 to 20 megahertz. This guy was going at about 44. We then used electro uh, stimulus using a thermotact, using five milliamperes. We would detect excruciating pain at 20 milliamperes. We were going at about um, here, 65 and 135 before he started to detect pain. So he was completely insensate. What we did was we treated one limb. We treated the left limb and we didn't treat the right limb. We did six treatments over one week period. And what happened was, in the treated limb, we found that vibration perception returned. Although not to physiological levels, but significantly restored. The untreated limb continued to deteriorate. It didn't feel the same. This is something which diabetic senses, uh, centers which do not have uh, quantitative measurements are at risk. Because you will find that if you look at your reports, Monofilament tuning forks, they will say, no change, no change. It is not no change. It is progressively getting worse, but it's beyond the capacity of those basic instrumentations to detect a change. Okay? Um, we highlighted this uh, to our clinics in, in New Zealand, and we told them that once in two years, if the patient returns and you are finding that 
they are not changing based on your monofilament, send them to the tertiary center for biotheseometer studies and for electrophysiological electro studies because then we can start to detect disease progression. So we were very encouraged with the results of, now this is a 52 week, my report here is 24, but 52 weeks later, the survival of the treatment which we did remains. So we treated the second limb, the untreated limb, and that limb simultaneously has now improved in its sensory perception. So can we prevent diabetic ulcers? Well, potentially. This is only one case. We are going to do a pilot of 30, okay? So that's basically where we are. I will stop right now and ask for questions. This is a new research which we are going to do. We're trying to reverse the effects of type 2 diabetes and hopefully we will find some research partners in this region. Thank you. Any questions? All right, thank you very much. Uh, if you have uh, one question, we have time for that. Anybody comes? Okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before you go, there is a... Uh